As you are able, please stand to hear God's call to worship Him. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. And you are ready to take the scroll and to open the seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased the name for God that reigns forever and ever. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Amen. Please remain standing for our first hymn. And that first hymn is number 352, Oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus, number 352.
Before uh, Mike reads the scripture for today's sermon, I have an Old Testament scripture lesson for us as well. This comes from Isaiah chapter 5. This is God's word. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. I want to encourage you to open up your Bibles for the scripture lesson this morning, page 1071 in John's Gospel. We're in chapter 15, and we're going to read the first 11 verses of that chapter. Brothers and sisters, I remind you, this is the very Word of God. Let us give it careful attention. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that, he does, that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him He it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples." As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So far the reading of God's word. Would you join me in prayer? Our Father and our God, as your word has been read aloud, we confess that your word is truth and that we as your children continue to learn your word. Your word in us is the hope of glory. Christ in us, the incarnate word, the hope of glory. And so, Father, we come asking that you minister to us by your spirit through your word that you teach us. And for that, Father, for that purpose, I ask that you would please bless my thoughts and words so that they would bring glory to you alone and that they would be food for your sheep. In Christ's name, amen. So this morning, we come to the last, the seventh of the I Am sayings in this series. Or is it the last? You'll have to come back next week to find out the answer to that question. Uh, (laughs) Traditionally, 
This is the seventh of the I am sayings of Jesus. And um, we need to pay attention that there's something that has changed here. Uh, it actually changed last week too. That there has been a um, there's been a slight change in context that's just pure teaching, but it's teaching in a particular context. We're in the upper room now. This part of John's gospel, we're in the upper room. Uh, one thing that's curious about John's gospel is that he devotes a great deal of his gospel just to that upper room discourse. And even though he does not record the Passover meal, the Last Supper, the transition into the New Covenant, the way the Synoptic Gospel does, it's clear that's the context here. He, he likely doesn't care, cover the Lord's Supper because Matthew, Mark, and Luke did such a phenomenal job of it, he didn't feel the need to repeat it. But they're in the upper room. And there's a looming cloud above their heads. Jesus has been teaching regularly to them that part of his ministry, part of his fulfillment of the Father's work for him to do is to be handed over to authorities and to be killed. He has talked about it on several occasions throughout their ministry. And now in these last days, these last hours, the threat of that is looming large. A lot of the Savior's words lately have been uh, toward let not your hearts be troubled. About going away. Going away not to be separated permanently, but in order to accomplish a work. To secure a future for them. Their great, wonderful, charismatic speak, uh, spokesman Peter has been told by this time that he's going to shortly deny even knowing who the Savior is. It's starting to feel like things might be starting to really come apart at the seams. All these wonderful plans of tri a triumphant ministry seem to be falling apart for them. And so last week, he brings those wonderful words. Let not your hearts be troubled. Trust in God Trust also in me. And, and throughout the 14th chapter, he will make it clear that he and the Father are one. Uh, to, there is no trusting of God without trusting in the Son. He's about the Father's business, and that's all he's about. And then here in chapter 15, he brings out an analogy that seems out of left field. Unless you know your Old Testament. I am the true vine. I'm the true vine, he says. Now we tend to we tend to think and understand that word true over against its opposite, false, correct? And there's a sense that that is true, pun intended. But we need to see that Jesus is often using this word true as in genuine, as in the fullness of, the, the full article, right? But what is this vine thing? Well, I asked Pastor Pete to read an Old Testament passage before he sat down, Isaiah chapter 5. In Isaiah chapter 5, he clearly, clearly makes the absolute connection that this was a favorite, favorite designation of Israel, of God's people in the Old Covenant. A vine. A vine. Let me read one more key verse from Psalm 80. From Psalm 80. You brought a vine out of Egypt... Well, you don't have to be a big-time biblical scholar to immediately recognize that, right? Who was brought out of Egypt? This is a quiz. You, you're feel free to answer. Thank you. I just want to make sure you're awake. That's all. I'd hate to be up here just going on to find out that you slept through it all. 
You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You, you gave the land to them. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The psalmist there in Psalm 80 is, is proclaiming this wonderful truth about God's vine, his people. And Isaiah 5, which I asked Peter to read, talks about, I planted this great vine and I did everything for it and I went to go to harvest and what did I find? Wild grapes. Not, not, not the fruit that I was hoping for, a different kind of fruit. Wild grapes. That's the background for when Jesus says, I'm the true vine. All the failures of my people in the old covenant, their inability to keep the conditions of the covenant, their, their constant turning inward on themselves rather than being a light to the nations, their constant obsession with the law as though it's the means of salvation. It didn't produce the kind of fruit in fullness that it's supposed to. It produced wild grapes, a, a fruit of its own, its own type. He's the true vine now, he says. I'm the one that's going to bring full, full expression of what it means to be Israel. I'm the true Israelite, he's saying. Just like I'm the true Adam. Just like the first Adam failed in his obedience. Now the last Adam, Jesus is the obedient one, the obedient image of God. He's using true vine in all those senses, using those Old Testament images for the shadows and pointers, signposts they were, pointing to Jesus, the one who would fulfill all these requirements, these obligations, and these wonderful blessings that God intends for his people. Jesus is the one who will bring this true life, this real fruit. And Jesus identifies three important aspects in this statement. There's really three characters here. Jesus is the vine, the true source of all, of all things that God intends and all that God promises. He is the source as the vine. The people of God, that's you and I, and all of the people of God around the globe, our, our dear brothers and sisters who, who've, who've suffered this terrible loss over in Tanzania with this accident, they're our brothers and sisters, they're part of the branches, they're part of the vine too. For all time, we're the branches. We're called to bear fruit. Fruit in keeping with the nature and the trueness of the vine. And then thirdly, there's God the Father. Who's he? He's the gardener. He's the vine dresser. He's the one who cares for the vineyard. Who knows how to help it bring the right kind of fruit. And first off, the right kind of fruit needs the right kind of vine, a perfect one, a perfect image bearer. All things rooted in God the Son. He's the vine dresser who cuts, who prunes, who guides in his perfect wisdom. So let's talk about Jesus, the true vine. Israel has failed to be productive. Now let's make sure we understand that statement. Because that can sound like, ah, what a bunch of failures. He, he had no interest, they all fail, they're all going to hell. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, my people, the, the fullness of what I intend is a pure grape. A wild grape is, is that that's been mixed with the wrong stock. It's flowing some from the true vine, but it, it's, it's inserted its own personality into it. Not the personality of its creator and its redeemer. The law. The law is necessary. 
The law is good. But to become obsessed with the law the way many of them did, the Jewish leadership that was constantly on the attack against Jesus misunderstands the role of the law. You know the only thing the law can do? The only thing God's law can do is show Mike Coffee where he has failed miserably before his creator. And I hate to bear the bad news, but I can assert your name where I inserted my name just as easily. But it doesn't have a solution. In a sense, he's the vine that not only is the perfect law keeper, but in his death and resurrection becomes a life-giving spirit that branches out into his people as the true vine into a new type of life. A life where the condemnation of the law has been solved. And now a lifeblood from a resurrected life flows freely. He's the source of life. He's the true Adam. And the branches that are attached to this true Adam will bring fruit according to that nature. As they're attached to the true vine. You see, he continually throws in here, I don't know how many times you heard it in here. We don't use this word commonly in our language these days. I dare say none of you has rattled off a sentence, either on the phone or in a text lately, where you used the word abide. Right? Probably not. What does that mean? It means to remain. To hold fast. Abide in me. Remain in me. Because he says... It's crucial. It's the only way for a true branch to bear true fruit, true fruit, is to be attached to the true vine. He couldn't be more clear. He says in there, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do a little something. Oh no, he didn't say that, did he? Even though that's the way we tend to treat it. He didn't say, apart from me, you can do a few good things. What did he say? Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, wait a minute, Pastor Mike. This is where I have a problem with the Bible. Because I see a lot of people who have no interest in Christ or God, and they do a lot of good stuff. How can the Bible say something like that? I'm glad you asked that question. The Bible never says that there aren't relative good works in the world. In fact, the Bible says it's a a wonderful blessing of God, even though he'll never get credit for it. The works that he's talking about are works in Christ. Those are the only works that will last. They are the only eternal works with eternal consequences. The other good works serve for a wonderful purpose and they're a gracious gift, but they will not last. They do not bring glory to the Creator and the Savior. Rather, they deny them. And in so doing, they fall into the works of the devil. You you don't need those definitions. You don't need to hear that guy. Look, you can have life on your own and he forgets to tell you that all those good works apart from Christ result in eternal death. The biggest philanthropist who's given away fortunes and fortunes apart from Christ will suffer eternal condemnation. But that's not fair. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. It's completely fair. You want life without God? You get to spend eternity without God. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Remaining attached to the vine is crucial for growth, is crucial for bearing correct fruit, is crucial for not producing wild grapes. It's how we grow. 
It's how we're pruned. We'll look at that in just a little bit. You know, I hear people all the time talk about, I don't need church. God and I can do church on our own. I don't don't need, you know, churches are problems. Half the people in there I don't like. I don't think they like me. You're probably right. (laughs) But let me tell you what saying a a statement like that, I, I don't need church for my relationship with God. That is like saying to your spouse, I love you, honey, but I don't want to live with you. That's like saying, hey, I've been married for 60 years. What's the secret to your success? Well, we've lived apart for 55. (laughs) What? You haven't been married, living the married life. Well, that's the way I define it. You see, there's an, in, there's an intentional falsehood there. God the Father, the vine dresser. One of the things that says he does, he cuts away dead branches. You know those branches that grow... And in the wintertime, they look like they're still alive from the outside, but they're already dead on the inside. And once spring comes, you see it's, it's not doing anything. It looked one way, but actually didn't have anything flowing on the inside. He's got to cut them away. The disciples didn't realize it at the time, but they just witnessed an example of that in that very room just moments before. Do you remember what happened? Jesus looks at Judas and says, go and do what you're going to do. Do it quickly. Dead branch had already left the room. He looked for a long time like he was actually attached to the vine. He was never attached to the vine. He was just playing church. You know, he was like those people that think that they're going to get to heaven and show them their time card. Look at how many check marks I've got here. You were never attached to the vine. You believed there is a God, you just didn't believe God. He gets away, he cuts away dead branches, but he also prunes. This is the hard one, isn't it? He prunes. About two years ago, we were getting ready for a special event around our household. And uh, we have a bunch of trees in the backyard. And they were a mess. Overgrown and just, yeah. So we hired an arborist. That's a fancy word for a tree cutter. And you know, it was fascinating to watch him work because there was so much growth in these trees that it's just like, I I don't know where you start. What what do you do? And that guy got up in there and was tied in with ropes and everything like that. And he'd sit there and look and look and then, and he'd stop and he'd look some more. and He knew right where to go. He knew exactly what he's doing because he's an expert. You see where I'm going? God's an expert pruner. He he knows how to prune in our lives. We just don't always like it. You know one of the ways, the most common way he prunes? What's happening right now? Sitting under the teaching and preaching of God's word. Because it comes along and it challenges things that you hold near and dear sometimes. And it causes you to check yourself and go, could I be wrong on this? That's the easiest type of pruning. But it needs to be constant. Because he's the purveyor of truth, not us. Sometimes he prunes by the consequences of our sin, doesn't he? He allows those consequences to to pan out. 
so that we see that our way is not the way. And sometimes he prunes by events or circumstances of life, like tragic deaths that break our hearts. But he's always pruning on his true branches. Why? Because he's looking to build strength and more fruit. We need to talk about fruit just a little bit. The American church in recent years and recent decades has really lost track of what it means to bear fruit. We hear that and we only think numbers. Because as good North Americans in a society like ours, numbers is the only thing that counts. Winning souls to Christ, that's part of it. But I am here to tell you that an equally important part of bearing fruit is our discipleship and our growth. Our being in Christ and being conformed into the image of our Savior, understanding his truth, putting our golden idols down and allowing him to bring new priorities into our lives. New thinking, better understanding. The goal is fruit of all types, not just new converts. Real growth in grace, in knowledge, in love. You know, some Protestants over the years have overreacted to the issue of good works. In our reaction against Rome and its idea of salvation and its theology, we've, we've gone so far the opposite way that, you know, we don't even want to talk about good works. Let me be very clear. As Reformed Christians, as Reformed Protestant Christians, we believe in good works. We are set aside for them of how we minister to one another, how we love one another, how we serve our Savior. But we distinguish that we are interested in good works, not salvific works. And I use that term salvific in this definition. Works that either contribute to or cause our salvation. We do not believe in those. That is all of Christ and him on the cross. But our good works are used by him for his glory and for the testimony of his name. We clear on that? I'm using up all the time. We're going to be here late, so get over it. (laughs) Did that not sound contrite enough? I'm sorry. Oh, wow. What are you going to do with that? I don't know. How about works of love? Works of love. We support and encourage one another as children of God. As we navigate the high points and the low points of the Christian life. Part of the benediction that I commonly use as a charge for you to go from this place and love one another just as God in Christ has loved you. That's a real thing. As a pastor, there is one thing that completely has befuddled me, and I think I will go to my grave without this understanding. I do not and never will understand why there are so many believers who purposely or consistently make life difficult for other believers. I will never understand it. It's always on some golden calf theological nugget that they think that they're right about and their theology is usually all screwed up but they just can't resist making life hard on other people. I hate to tell you folks, but a critical spirit is not listed as a fruit of the spirit. A life of joy, a life of love, a life of joy. Joy of the Savior in his children. Did you know that? Did you know that Jesus takes joy in his children. It's at the heart of our worship where we proclaim the grandeur and majesty and beauty and power of all that he is. And we try to do that on a daily basis. But the joy also of the children in the Savior. I've had two opportunities in my life to listen to a lecture by Joni Erickson Tata. Some of you may know that name. The last time was at a Ligonier conference many years ago. If you don't know that name, Joni Erickson Tata, she was paralyzed. She became a quadriplegic 
by a diving accident in her teen years. On both occasions, when I heard her talk, I was jealous. That woman has a joy in the Lord that I'm jealous of. And I try to pursue that equal expression. I haven't got there yet. I'm trying. A quadriplegic and a joy that is so profound, you can tell by listening to Joni that she knows for absolute certain that this stuff, this life, this world is only the small beginnings and it ain't nothing compared to what lies in wait for all who love him. It exudes out of her like a perfume, a very strong perfume. You know, when you guys bathe in it rather than just splash a little on, It's awesome. We are chosen before the foundations of the world for his love and to express that love. We are chosen for good works that glorify Christ and his name and his gospel. And we are chosen to have joy. Joy is belonging to him, joy in relating to him, Joy in abiding in him. This table is all about abiding, friends. This is another opportunity to celebrate the covenant to sign, to say, this is my source. I have nothing else. My hope is built in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. To abide in him and say, here's the hard part. I'm here to prune. I know it's coming. Help me with it. There's an old hymn. I should have brought it. I asked the Lord that I might grow. Look it up. I asked the Lord that I might grow. Read those lyrics. Wow. We get to celebrate this morning, this table together. This table is for those who are in Christ by faith. Not those playing church. Not those that are merely interested yet. If you're just interested, if you haven't made that commitment yet, and you, want, you need to come talk to one of those pastors, this is for those who are in Christ. This is a, a special, wonderful sign that we get to practice our faith in saying, you're our vine and our vine dresser. Amen? Father, thank you so much for your word to us today. And as we now prepare to celebrate this table together, Father, make these signs and seals a beautiful reality for us, a further expression of your grace and your continuing love in all of us as your children. In Christ's name, amen. And if you would please stand and join me in singing our final hymn, number 686, O God, our help in ages past, number 686.
And amen. Brothers and sisters, may the love of God the Father, the fellowship of Christ the Son, the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with and among you both now and forever. Go from this place and love one another, even as God in Christ has loved you. Amen.